Great. All right. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to um, present um, this paper. And I'm doing this on behalf of uh, myself and um, Professor Charles Aka, whom I co-authored this paper with. And unfortunately, I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to join you physically, but I've been um, following um, some of the presentations in the different sessions. So the paper I'm presenting on is Domestic Savings in Sub-Saharan Africa, the case um, of Ghana. And my presentation is going to be following this outline, so I'll provide some brief introduction and um, background um, to the study. And then I would share um, what the main research objectives were, the data, and then the empirical estimations and I'll discuss some of the results that we found, and I'll um, finalize my presentation by uh, providing a summary and conclusions and also sharing some recommendations based on our study. So it's already been established from the previous speakers how important savings is when it comes to um, uh, you know, capital accumulation and investments and the important role this actually plays in driving economic growth, particularly in the, in the long run. So because of the importance of savings, most of the macroeconomic growth models that we know of um, have continuously encouraged countries, particularly for developing countries, to be able to increase savings and investments in order to drive their growth and development um, agenda. While this has been done several times, like you know, over the long period, most sub-Saharan African countries have struggled over the period to be able to mobilize resources from you know, their domestic resources to be able to finance their growth and development um, agenda. So uh, if we go back in time using data from the 1970s to the 1990s, for instance, the data shows that um, for this particular sub-region, there's been consistent declines in um, private savings over time, going from 11% to about 9% um, in, within this period. And using more recent data over the two decade period from 2000 to 2020, we still see a similar trend of um, declines in um, savings from about 30% to about 20%. So what this means is that in, in view of the low savings that these countries are recording, most of these countries actually um, can, can people hear me? Hello? We can't hear you. All right, great. I, I got some feedback, so I wanted to be sure that I wasn't speaking to myself. Um, so in view of the, um, the low savings, um, you know, mo domestic resource mobilizations that these countries have faced over time, uh, most of these countries have had to rely very heavily on foreign aid and also external sources of finance to be able to drive their development um, agenda. In the case of Ghana, um, there's been a recent call to actually have development that goes beyond aid. So we have like a very popular mantra in Ghana that talks about, um, you know, growth beyond aid, which has brought this new focus and renewed interest in mobilizing resources um, um, in a, in a more, like on the domestic market to be able to drive the growth and development agenda that we, we seek to um, have. Now, what does the literature say about the determinants of um, domestic savings? And this has been um, very well documented in the literature. So we do have income-related variables, and the previous speakers have all already alluded to some of these important um, um, determinants. So we have GDP per capita, we have economic growth rates, we have interest rates, um, which have all been well um, documented. And we also have macroeconomic variables, right? fiscal policies, monetary policies, and most importantly for um, developing countries that rely mainly on primary commodities, we have that important uh, macroeconomic volatilities and the external shocks that it comes with. So you have a situation where you have um, unfavorable terms of trade, and that actually works its way into adversely affecting um, savings in, in these countries. In more recent times, we've had a growing literature. And, and in the previous session before the lunchtime, there was a whole session on like institutions, political institutions and environments, and how this is very important um, for domestic resource mobilizations. You can think of things like if your financial sector or your, your, your legal system is, is not really strong, then people are not able to um, you know, carry out um, uh, financial contracts. And this creates a lot of um, 
um, you know, lack of confidence in the in the in the system. So there's also things um, relating to um, a democracy, things relating to corruption, which all have important implications on um, domestic savings. So these are all things that have been well documented um, in the literature. Now, although we have learned a lot when it comes to these determinants, there's still um, some gap in, in, in the existing literature. So, and, and the first one has to do with the fact that most of the existing studies that we have have focused more on a block of countries at a go. So you, you, you look at studies that focus on sub-Saharan Africa, you look at studies on domestic resource mobilization that focuses on the SADC regions. So what, is, what this does is that um, we lose a lot of the heterogeneities or the nuances of individual countries and and we, we are not able to see for a particular country what is actually driving um these um so these savings behavior and aside that many of the studies have also focused on more short-run relationships which also limits our understanding of what works or what the relationships are which are important for um long run and um, or long-term policy making for uh domestic resource mobilization so this takes us to um, the main research objective here, which is to be able to determine the long-term drivers of savings in Ghana, and also to be able to establish if indeed there are long-term relationship between savings and then the variables that we think are relevant in the Ghanaian um, context. Now, how do we um, implement this, you know, achieve this research objective? We use data from the 1980s to 2020, and then um, we use, and, and this, particular period was chosen um, because it has a very important, like it, it captures a lot of the um, major policies and programs that have been um, implemented over the time. And um, we believe that you, focusing on this particular period would give us like a, a, a good understanding of um, what is changing and how what is changing is actually affecting um, savings in our context. So some of these important policies include um, the economic recovery program, in the 1980s and then the structural adjustment programs and this was the, the the very turbulent times in the in the history of our country and then the 2000s became more of the stabilizing period where we have the uh, growth and poverty reduction strategies one and two and aside these policies we also had the monetary we've had quite a number of monetary and financial reforms because if we look back um, at the crisis period um, a lot of repressive policies were implemented and that's actually discouraged financial deepening and savings and and, and some of these policies included uh, um, uh, anyway so um, I think given the time I'm just going to highlight the main um, findings from our study so basically we found that um, in our case there was no um, long-run relationship between um, private savings and the um, the variables that we're considering but in the in the short run, we did find the the impact or or the effect of the significant effects on um, uh, of um, GDP per capita, which initially which was um, negative, but then the square was uh, a positive um, effect. So our interpretation of that is that um, at the low levels of um, um, income, um, you know, or be, beyond a certain threshold, we we start to see that positive relationship between. Um, income and savings. So that means that at some point, um, you know, people, uh, household or economic agents would have to deal with their basic needs first before um, if their incomes increase up to a, a certain point, then they, they get to um, uh, increase um, savings. Then we also saw um, that there was a significant effect on the lag of um, uh, money which is like the uh, is, is a proxy for monetary policy, which then also tells us that um, Policymakers would have to be more uh, to be to have in the, at the back of their minds that whatever policies that they are um, implementing today is has a persistent effect in the future. So you find um, people's behavior being based on what they know to be the case in the past. So these are the main findings that we had, and we thought that the the policy implications there would be that um, uh, we should continue as a country to pursue policies that would increase households income so that once they're able to deal with their basic needs we we actually see that beyond that threshold um there will be increases in savings 
and um yeah so i think i would end here so that i can get i'll give um other people the chance to um you know respond to the discussions i i sincerely apologize that i wasn't you were not able to see my full um, presentation thank, thank you. you thank you monica